Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I feel like I'm at Dodger Stadium. My, my voice is being heard. Um, I want to thank all of you. I got to do that. Should I start again? So I heard me, but nobody else did. Okay, I'm going to start again then. We have people that are participating virtually as well. So I want to welcome everybody to our first in-person event since March 2020. This is a hybrid event. So some of us are here um, in person and another 80 people are participating virtually. So this is a, a, a very good turnout for us um, if we aggregate it together. Um, this is the next to the last event in the Edgerton series on responding to a, a rising China. We're going to have one more event in uh, uh, sometime uh, before the end of the year. Um, and I want to thank, and I don't know if they hear me, but if they do, Dr. Brand and Mrs. Louise Edgerton uh, from the Edgerton Foundation. Um, this is a series that's been going on for two, and, you know, for a long, long time. And I want to thank Brad and Louise not only for suggesting the idea, but for making it possible. Um, since the beginning, we've had Ambassador John Negroponte, uh, Kenneth Roth of Human Rights Watch, Jonathan Pollack from, from Brookings, and a variety of other experts um, speaking on various, per, various perspectives and issues related to, to China. Um, I also want to um, mention that we are having our Policy West, which used to be uh, uh, Members Weekend back in the day. Uh, it too will be a hybrid gathering. It's going to be on October 22nd. Um, we're going to be meeting in, in Beverly Hills, I think at the Beverly Hilton. Um, our keynote speaker is going to be Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Lisa Monaco. Uh, who's got all the interesting stuff at DOJ to work on and has a very interesting background. Uh, we're going to have Mario Cordero, the head of the Port of Long Beach, uh, Gene Soroka, the head of the Port of Los Angeles, um, and a variety of others. So it promises to be really interesting. Uh, the week before that, um, in, in conjunction with our partners at the World Affairs Council of San Francisco, uh, we are having a repeat visit by General Stanley McChrystal, who's spoken to the Pacific Council before. And we're doing a lot with San Francisco, largely because we want to speak uh, on behalf of the whole state of California and not only the, the southern part of it. I want to introduce our speaker and our moderator today. Um, and we are deeply lucky, honored, and pleased uh, to have uh, Dr. Larry Diamond, who is a native Angelino. He grew up here. He went to high school here. Uh, he is currently a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a member of the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford. Uh, by the way, Ambassador Spogli, uh, Ron Spogli and Brad Freeman are both Pacific Council members. I gave them a special invitation to hear someone from Freeman Spogli speak, so I, they may be participating virtually. Um, Dr. Diamond is an expert on democracy with global uh, applications, um, and um, so that he he heads the uh, Hoover Institution's program on China's global um, sharp power uh, and Taiwan um, as well. He just was telling me about a very interesting conference that he was part of um, having to do with Taiwan. He deals with democracy issues uh, globally uh, in the Arab world, uh, having to do with the rule of law um, and a variety of other things. He is extremely well published. Um, you know, if you're a political scientist today, you have read something written by, by Dr. Larry Diamond because he, he, he basically, given his expertise on democracy, um, he covers a wide uh, array of countries, um, all of which are in deep trouble, uh, including our own. Um, I also want to introduce his, 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 co, his, his, his interlocutor and his co-panelist, Dr. Dorothy Solinger. Uh, Dr. Solinger is a professor uh, emerita um, at the Department of Political Science at the University of California at Irvine. As is Dr. Diamond, she is well published and very well known in her, her field. And as is the case with the most academics, she's moved around to a lot of different places. She's been at Berkeley. Um, she was um, at the uh, University of Michigan where I began my career. So I have a special fondness for Michigan. 
um, national fellow at the Hoover Institution, uh, and so forth. And, and Dr. Solinger's area is of expertise um, is about Chinese domestic politics, uh, particular political sociology. China is one of these countries. Never have so has so much been said by so many who know so little about China. Uh, so to actually have people who have devoted their lives to studying a uniquely complex uh, country at a particularly challenging moment in history um, is a gift to us. So I want to thank I. Dr. Solinger for joining us. I also want to um, introduce um, Dr. Solinger's husband, Professor Thomas Bernstein, who is a professor emeritus um, at Columbia. And this is very romantic. They're now on the same coast after I suspect, you know, flying back and forth. So their life is one continuous second honeymoon, um, I hope. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, Professor Bernstein, I want to welcome you to the Pacific Council and welcome you back to Southern California after your many years in exile back on the rust, in the Rust Belt, as we affectionately call the East Coast. I want to welcome our speakers to the, to the podium. Again, um, I want to thank you both for spending time with us. I want to thank all of our virtual participants. I want to thank those of you who are here publicly, publicly and or in person. And uh, it's nice to gradually get back to what we do best, which is bringing people t together. So. Well, I just wanted to begin by reminding the audience about China's claim on Taiwan. It doesn't come out of nowhere. China, under the previous regime, the Qing Dynasty, that is the regime being the regime of dynasties and emperors from 1683 to 1895, was the legitimate ruler of Taiwan. In 1895, Japan took over after winning a war against China and ruled the island till 1945. After Japan's surrender at the end of World War II, Japan's properties, territories were given up and and that included Taiwan, but it wasn't made clear who was to be the new ruler of Taiwan. But when China was contested in a civil war between the Guomindang or Nationalist Party, which had been ruling China since the 1920s, and the Chinese Communist Party, which has been ruling China since 1949, uh, at the end of the Civil War, the Communist Party won, and the Nationalist Party retreated to the island of Taiwan. Both sides claim to be the government of China. So this is the beginning of China's claim to Taiwan. Um, I will ask Larry now to bring us up to date with the present status of Taiwan's democracy and security. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Dory, so much. It's great to see you again, and Tom, too, and of course, Jerry Green, and um, it's great to be back in LA. Uh, another way to present the history, uh, and the history is really valuable, Dory, thank you so much for distilling it is that um, uh, the government on mainland China has only exercised effective sovereignty uh, over Taiwan for four of the last 125 years. Um, and so uh, the status remains very much in dispute. Um, we do have a policy uh, in the United States uh, that's been codified in numerous uh, communiques uh, over the years, uh, in, including the ones that accompanied the official uh, uh, recognition of, um, of China's government and the establishment of diplomatic relations and therefore the movement to 
informal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, that there is, um, uh, that we recognize only one China uh, and not uh, two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan, but that the dispute over, uh, you know, uh, what the final resolution should be of this conflict between the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the People's Republic uh, of China uh, governed from Beijing is one that uh, we are deeply committed to uh, believing should only uh, be resolved peacefully and not uh, by coercion. So um, I imagine we'll get in uh, to more of the details of that, but I I'd make the following kind of orienting points. The first is that um, uh, uh, around the time uh, that we were uh, shifting diplomatic relations, I think that uh, in the late 1970s, uh, I think that Taiwan's ruler, Zhang Jingkuo, was beginning to realize that uh, uh, democracy was vital to Taiwan's security and that if Taiwan was to be able to uh, maintain the support of the United States at a time when democracy was gathering momentum in the world, Taiwan would need to move from being one of these successful authoritarian East Asian tigers to being a genuine democracy. And that uh, accelerated a process between uh, 1987 and, and 1996 with the direct election uh, uh, for the first time of a president of uh, Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, Li Deng Wei, uh, that has resulted in Taiwan being one of the most successful democracies uh, of these to, to have emerged uh, in the last 45 years, a period that's been dubbed the third wave of global democratization. Uh, and if you look at the annual ratings uh, of Freedom House, the organization in New York that assesses levels of political and civil freedom in the world, uh, or any of the other ratings agencies, The Economist magazine, and so on, you see that um, Taiwan is, is not only you know, one of the most successful democracies in Asia now, it's probably the most liberal uh, in terms of the scope for civil rights and citizen accountability, freedom of the press, and so on and so forth. So one of the issues that arises uh, in the debates, policy debates that uh, continue to happen about uh, America's posture uh, toward the region and toward Taiwan and the rising concern about the threat that the People's Republic of China poses to Taiwan is, uh, do we have a special responsibility uh, beyond the security uh, 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 implications, the national interest of the United States in a balance of power in East Asia, uh, the commitments we have under the Taiwan Relations Act uh, to uh, help Taiwan defend itself. Do we have a special responsibility that derives from the fact that Taiwan, uh, this remarkable system now of some 24 million people, is one of the most vibrant, uh, liberal, pluralistic, and successful democracies in the world. Or another way of putting it, and a way that uh, I think harkens back to uh, a very dark period in world history in the mid to late 1930s, uh, do the democracies of the world uh, have a responsibility to ensure that a free uh, society will not be swallowed uh, by an expanding neo-totalitarian state, which is what I regard the People's Republic uh, of China under Xi Jinping as. So let me say, I don't want a, this to be a, a monologue. Let me just make four analytic points, Dory, and we can probe deeper into them uh, uh, as you wish. Um, we have just finished a con conference at the Hoover Institution literally earlier this week on ensuring peace in the Taiwan Strait. Um, I will tell you, it's the scariest conference I've ever been involved in uh, because we had to probe uh, the real possibility, the rising possibility uh, of uh, military action by the People's Republic of China, 
to compel Taiwan uh, into uh, unification, reunification, choose your term depending on your reading of uh, history. And um, I think what is in part alarming about the period we are entering uh, in terms of Taiwan's security and its relationship to American national security and the defense of our values is that uh, there are several trends that are moving along at a pretty rapid pace that um, are all coming together at once. One uh, is the shift in the internal politics uh, in both China and Taiwan. And I think we have in China now, Dory knows, Tom knows, Jerry knows, I'm gonna tell you, I am not a China expert. Uh, I don't speak Chinese, it's not my area of expertise, but as a scholar of democracy and someone deeply interested in uh, Taiwan and committed to its security, I've felt the need to become uh, more aware uh, of China and its internal uh, as well as uh, international trends. And I think Xi Jinping represents a new uh, type of leader uh, in uh, post-Mao China, uh, one who has grander ambitions, has been fairly candid about them, obviously uh, has erased term limits and will probably be there indefinitely as ruler, will be uh, given a third term, I presume, next year. And uh, under Xi, uh, we have seen uh, uh, rise of Chinese nationalism and much more uh, explicit um, talk of uh, not ruling out force as an option. Greater coercion, uh, greater signaling uh, that if Taiwan doesn't come to terms and accept the same one country, two systems framework uh, uh, that Hong Kong had and that led to the fate that Hong Kong has now uh, suffered that if that didn't happen politically through negotiations, uh, it could well be compelled coercively. Then you have the change inside uh, Taiwan uh, that the people of Taiwan have really pretty much permanently turned away uh, from any desire for reunification. This is a trend that's been building for a long time, but uh, public opinion polls are done every few months on Taiwan identity. And back 30 years ago, uh, you had a significant proportion of the population in Taiwan that thought of themselves as uh, only Chinese. And most of the rest thought of themselves as Chinese and Taiwanese. Uh, that's been in a gradual trend toward Taiwan identity. And now over 60% of the Taiwan public thinks of themselves as only Taiwanese and really are not interested at any point in the future in unification uh, with China. Uh, they uh, favor overwhelmingly adhering to the status quo only for obvious uh, political reasons. So beyond the shift in politics in China and Taiwan are, are three other alarming things. One is the shift in geopolitics as um, China you know, pushes out and becomes more uh, ambitious of a world player uh, and US power um, uh, you know, falls deeper and deeper into retreat. Uh, and then there's a debate about what that means for the US will to use whatever power it has. Then there's been, uh, and this is a lot of what we discussed in our conference, a dramatic shift in the military balance of power. And I will just say here that some of you may recall that when Taiwan had that first direct presidential election uh, to inaugurate or finish the transition to democracy in early 1996, that prior to that in 1995, after President Lee Dung Wei visited Cornell University and again shortly before the election, uh, China launched missiles and was really behaving in a very intimidating way. And in early 1996, the United States sent two aircraft carrier battle groups uh, to the Taiwan Strait to send a message that uh, we, you know, uh, we didn't have an explicit policy on this, but 
We were quite prepared to defend Taiwan if necessary. We could not do that today because Chinese missiles would sink the aircraft carrier battle groups. And indeed, our aircraft carrier battle groups uh, couldn't get anywhere near uh, uh, the East China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, uh, without being vulnerable to destruction by a vastly, ambitiously uh, modernized uh, People's Liberation Army with all sorts of precision equipment. Uh, and when you consider as well that while we have overall military superiority, any conflict would be in the theater of uh, the People's Republic of China, and we'd be very far away, uh, the shift in the military balance is very sobering. And our commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, uh, Admiral Davidson, has testified in recent hearings to the U.S. Congress that he thinks it's just, um, you know, uh, maybe six years from now that the threat will really be uh, quite present and um, uh, current uh, in terms of a dilemma for U.S. national security. And finally, yeah, uh, I'll just mention that there's been a shift in the geoeconomics as well with the rise uh, of the uh, global trade in semiconductors and the way China and Taiwan are implicated in that. Uh, I do want to make one point here, which is that it's very unlikely that China will attack Taiwan, or even that it can, but I don't, oh, sorry, I said it's very, meant to say, it's very unlikely that China will attempt to attack Taiwan, and there's even debate about whether it successfully can, unless people or leaders in Taiwan declare formally that Taiwan is independent. So we have to cross our fingers and hope that Taiwan will not take that provocative step. China is not inclined to attack Taiwan and doesn't hope to do that, even though it has not renounced military force and even though it does intend to reunify Taiwan with the mainland. It won't do it unless Taiwan declares independence. So next uh, question is, what is Taiwan's present national security strategy, and does it need to make a change? Uh, good, good question. Uh, before I answer that, uh, let me uh, offer a, a, a couple of friendly amendments to the very important observation you made, Dory. Um, I worry uh, that there are things Taiwan could do to alter uh, the status quo, even short of formally declaring independence, that might be extremely dangerous and destabilizing. Uh, and I would add that uh, the current president of, of Taiwan, the first woman president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, is a very, very sober, careful, responsible, uh, and I think effective national leader. She's been very restrained and very careful but it's a democracy and there's a presidential uh, election coming up in Taiwan in 2024. Uh, she will have completed her second term and won't be eligible for re-election. So we don't know what the succession will be. Um, I think you're right in your analysis about the People's Republic of China today. I'm not sure that their patience in terms of simply accepting the status quo uh, is infinite, and that's part of what worries me. Taiwan's uh, military strategy uh, has basically been uh, to buy a large number of uh, very sophisticated uh, and high-profile American weapons systems, uh, F-16s, uh, submarines, uh, and uh, some other sophisticated weapon systems that are very expensive, uh, very sophisticated tanks, uh, and that would that take a long time to build and acquire and train and in integrate into the Taiwan Armed Forces, uh, and that could uh, quickly uh, be destroyed in a first strike by the People's Liberation Army. Uh, and therefore, um, 
uh, a lot of security planners uh, in Taiwan and in the United States as a kind of friendly interlocutor uh, have been pushing the idea of a more distributed and asymmetrical defense instead of a few big high-tech things, investing a larger proportion of Taiwan's defense budget in a smaller number of distributed uh, uh, things, including large numbers of ships that uh, of smaller ships that might be able to uh, disguise themselves as you know whatever fishing vessels and uh, be distributed across the coast but uh, would have equipment that would involve weapon systems that were small but lethal and precise and could conflict a very high cost on any uh, uh, assaulting uh, aggressor and this is a debate now in Taiwan between uh, uh, defense planning officials that want to see a uh, uh, continuation of the other approach, the, the high-tech, big weapon system approach, and those who favor what's called the overall defense concept, an idea that's been uh, introduced by the former defense chief of staff of Taiwan, Admiral Li Shi Min, uh, that many of us think is a much better bet for Taiwan uh, to actually be able to deter attack from happening and to repel attack uh, if, it, if it should happen. And then the other, um, you know, a cornerstone of Taiwan's national security strategy uh, is um, to quote uh, former President Barack Obama, to not do stupid stuff. Uh, and therefore to not only not declare independence, but to avoid provocative changes in the symbols of sovereignty, would it be the flag or, uh, you know, other associated architecture that would make uh, the leadership of China or of mainland China or the society, which in the mainland is experiencing, as you know, a kind of resurgence of nationalism feel that Taiwan is permanently separating and, quote, needs to be dealt with. Uh, uh, thank you. Another issue here is the role of other powers in the Asia, I mean, the Indo-Pacific region. And that primarily involves Japan, India, and Australia who with the U.S. constitute the Quad. What roles are they playing or likely to play? Well, uh, I have noticed um, uh, a perceptible uh, evolution in Japanese thinking uh, about the security challenges in Northeast Asia toward much more wariness, if not alarm, about uh, China's military buildup the pace of modernization and expansion of the People's Liberation Army, which is now the, um, you know, uh, China now is the second largest dispender in the world on defense. And it's doing a lot of technological innovation on its own, which is why uh, we're facing some really serious technological challenges uh, in space and missiles. Uh, uh, and uh, they're starting to build their own aircraft carriers and so on. So I think there is greater uh, resolve in Japan than there's ever been before. Uh, as you know, Japan just had a uh, 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 internal LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, vote to select their new prime minister. Uh, and the person who won uh, was seen as a little bit kind of um, more robust uh, on these issues of quad partnership and um, a tough stance toward China uh, than the younger, more creative uh, uh, member of parliament, Taro Kono, the former foreign minister who lost. I'm not sure that was a fair characterization, but in any case, um, I, I think there is evolution in Japan, uh, Dory, toward, um, toward a stronger uh, resolve uh, in terms of upping their defense commitment and their readiness. And Australia, uh, I, I think, has just flipped in the last few years. You know, one of the things I've been working on uh, is China's influence activities 
uh, political warfare or a united front activity, whatever you want to call it, within democracies of Asia and around the world. And Australia was one of their uh, their prime targets, and they got pretty far along. I could go into detail uh, later, or you know, after our formal se session, whatever you want. And then about five years ago, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Australians woke up and realized that this was becoming an existential challenge, uh, and they have become much more vigorous about monitoring uh, and identifying Chinese influence activities in Australia, and they've spoken up more as a result of which the PRC retaliated with pretty hurtful economic sanctions uh, on Australian wine and other exports to uh, China. And right now there is overwhelming public sentiment in Australia, again, for the Quad Partnership that you mentioned and for, um, trying to ensure a, a stabilizing balance in the region. And finally, to India, as you know, they've always been wary of any kind of alliance or partnership with the US, and they've got to manage this country on their land border in a way uh, that's a very existential for them. They just had a, a shooting conflict on that Himalayan border not that long ago, um, but, you know, within that constraint that India is not going to sign any kind of security alliance or, or treaty with the US, there are interesting movements toward the deepening of the Quad partnership. Yeah. The next issue. The next issue has to do with economics. Taiwan is a major producer and exporter of semiconductors. So, how does this fit into the overall issue we're discussing? Well, uh, that is really one of the most uh, interesting and rapidly evolving pieces of this puzzle, Dory, because um, we really depend on semiconductors now for uh, almost everything we do. Uh, most, you know, cars of a certain more recent vintage of the I imagine at least the last couple decades uh, can't uh, work without semiconductors in them. I know that's true of Jerry's car. <laughs> I rode here with him. And, uh, you know, uh, one reason why we've had problems in automobile supply actually is that we've had chip shortages. And we're moving into an internet of things that will be highly dependent on uh, semiconductors. And of course, most of you, I think probably all of you have mobile phones uh, in your possession, and these are highly dependent on the what's called the bleeding edge uh, uh, semiconductors, getting smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner uh, in terms of their density. And these are measured in nanometers, uh, 28, 14, 10, 7, 5, whatever. Yeah. Uh, we're going getting smaller and smaller, and 92%, 92% of the world's most sophisticated, high-end, bleeding-edge semiconductors are made in Taiwan, uh, predominantly by TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation. The other 8% are made by Samsung. And so Taiwan, and, and the, Taiwan makes a lot of lower-end uh, semiconductors as well. So their position in the global semiconductor trade is just enormous. And the People's Republic of China is trying to catch up uh, and move into the high-end production, but they've been blocked from doing so by export controls uh, from the United States. So it's, um, uh, it's a very, very complicated angle on the problem. And people ask without having any answer, does this make China's leaders more desirous of somehow expediting uh, unification with Taiwan so that they can get a hold of its uh, semiconductor uh, development and manufacturing capacity? Or does it make them more wary because of the potential for disruption of global supply chains? And also there's the danger that if 
China were to attempt a military takeover, Taiwan people would resist and it's possible industry would be affected negatively. Yeah. So it's the people in China mulling over all this, I'm sure, are aware that they would have to be careful about using military force against Taiwan. Finally, going to the US, uh, the Biden administration has emphasized the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So what should the US be doing? What is the US national interest? What should we be doing to pursue it? And uh, what about reconsidering the position we've held for over 40 years of strategic ambiguity, according to which the US would, would try to help Taiwan, but it's not clear exactly what would provoke it or how it would do so. So I would say that um, one of the most uh, important uh, insights and points of probably consensus or near consensus uh, uh, in the conference we just held uh, that included two former chairmen of the uh, American, uh, American Institute uh, uh, in Taiwan, our de facto embassy, and uh, another person who was director, uh, most recent director of the institute there, as well as many, many policy figures, retired military people and so on, uh, was uh, to uh, strongly oppose any change in our position of strategic ambiguity. Uh, and there are two reasons why. Uh, one is that it could be very destabilizing and could provoke China, uh, the Chinese leadership, to thinking that we were moving to support Taiwan independence or would, and so they'd better do something to react before it was too late. So uh, it could be very dangerous and we really wouldn't gain much in, in return because um, uh, everyone in the room and everyone I've read uh, who's working on the Chinese military and their plans and their thinking uh, stresses, they're already assuming that the United States is going to respond militarily if they play the military card. So there's no deterrent value and there's a lot of destabilizing impact. So my formula would be the following, Dory. First of all, in rhetoric and in symbols, do nothing gratuitous to be provocative. Um, that is, keep affirming uh, the three no's, the six communiques, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, and uh, keep, um, uh, keep consistency uh, in the rhetorical and symbolic dimensions of American policy. That then rules out um, blustering or threatening language. But I've always been a big fan of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, precept, uh, talk softly and carry a big stick. And I think we need to deploy more force to the region. We need to do it in very creative ways because if we you know, just put more, uh, more force on uh, Okinawa, it could be wiped out in a Chinese missile first strike, uh, even potentially in Japan. Uh, and so we need to think creatively about how to have uh, adequate force available to respond without it being trapped as a sitting duck. I think this is going to mean a dramatic deepening of American military presence in Australia in the coming two decades and um, uh, other changes, including a deepening of the US-Japan partnership. Um, I will say as well uh, that I think there are many reasons for the United States uh, to deepen its relationship with Taiwan it's an amazing, ooh, I almost said country. Uh, it's an amazing uh, place. It's an amazing society. It's an amazing democracy. And it is a Chinese society. It's a, it's a, it's a society where uh, a lot of American scholars of China learn their Chinese. 
uh, and um, you know, a lot of Americans want to study Chinese, uh, and it's not really easy to do in China right now because of various restrictions. So I think we should be facilitating, perhaps in partnership with the Taiwan government, a huge increase in Americans studying in Taiwan and studying Chinese in Taiwan and preparing to engage, obviously, not only Taiwan, but all of China uh, in the decades uh, to come. Um, I would like to see also, I think this is another point of consensus or near consensus, a bilateral uh, trade agreement with Taiwan, which has been kind of, uh, you know, hanging out there in near completion for quite some time, and I think is a very important symbolic statement, but also important for our economic vitality and Taiwan's. And finally, uh, I, I can't close any discussion of American policy without saying, I think the single biggest wound we self-inflicted uh, in the last at least 10 years in terms of our interests uh, in East Asia at a minimum was to walk away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I cannot uh, emphasize enough how important the now um, CPTPP uh, is to not only our economic future in East Asia, but to our national security and stability in the region. China has now formally applied for entry in the CPTPP. I don't think that's going to come any, anytime soon because it would need unanimous consent among the members, some of whom are American allies. But um, we need to have our political uh, leaders um, have the courage and vision to say to the American people what most of them believe in private, this is really important uh, to our economic future and our future engagement with Asia. And um, you know there are compelling not only economic but geopolitical reasons why we should do it. Thank you very much for very interesting, stimulating, and thank you so much for very interesting, stimulating, and insightful comments. We have a few minutes left for questions from the audience. I don't know how I would get uh, questions from the um, people not present. Somebody's going to help me with that. But I see a hand over there already. Oh, this is about present people speaking. Hello, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. I just have a couple of questions. Could you speak uh, more loudly, th thank please? You, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I have a, a couple of questions. If the uh, mainland poses an existential threat to Taiwan, how does the Taiwan so, pays uh, so little uh, a fraction of its GDP uh, to the military uh, budget? It's about 1.7 percent. You know, I looked up statistics prior to coming here of other countries. For example, Israel that faces an existential threat is about 5.5 percent or 5.7 percent. So, uh, how, how does one explain that? Uh, second of all, uh, I would uh, argue that uh, the United States has another uh, commitment to Taiwan, given the fact it denuclearized the country. I mean, a number of years ago, Taiwan was intent on developing a nuclear weapons program, and the United States saw to it that that program would be eliminated. So that would be another commitment since we effectively uh, uh, eliminated uh, an ability to deter the, the mainland. So uh, thank you uh, for both of those questions. Um, uh, Taiwan's military spending has been increasing. Uh, it's not nearly high enough in my view and in the view of many others looking at it from a distance and in the view of some people in Taiwan. Uh, it's now above 2%. It's about 2.1% and it's on an upward trajectory, but it's not uh, nearly high enough. Uh, as you probably know from your, your research, Taiwan moved to an all-volunteer force uh, a few years ago, and that has kind of relieved the society pretty much of a shared sense of responsibility uh, for defense of Taiwan. They're starting to rethink that now and uh, develop uh, a new strategy uh, for reserves. Part of Admiral Lee's um, uh, overall defense concept, uh, which I strongly endorse, is the development through more rapid and limited training 
of a capacity for, you know, civil resistance, uh, and I'm saying armed civil resistance, uh, uh, should uh, uh, the People's Liberation Army actually invade Taiwan. And uh, the thrust of your question, if I can reduce it to this, is shouldn't Taiwan become a lot more like Israel in terms of mobilizing both its financial resources and its population uh, to be ready to fight? And um, my answer to you is yes, absolutely. And I've been saying that in Taiwan for a number of years now. And then just one final point, it's not only about what you spend, but how you spend it. And I fear that there is a kind of bureaucratic industrial alliance in Taiwan and in the United States that is very much advocating of spending a large share of Taiwan's defense budget on high-tech weaponry that will be destroyed very quickly in the event of uh, an actual conflict. And so um, it's important that Taiwan spend money on the right things. I don't think going nuclear in terms of weapons is a viable option. Uh, any movement in that regard, I think, would immediately provoke uh, a, a Chinese invasion and probably be hard to disguise, but in any case, it flies in the face of our paramount to commit commitment to nuclear non-proliferation. I will say I think Taiwan is making a big mistake in phasing out its civilian nuclear power as a source of energy, because I think Dory may be right that China isn't going to uh, launch an amphibious uh, assault anytime soon. I think they could launch a quarantine, a naval and air quarantine or blockade of Taiwan, and Taiwan has only a nine-day supply of, uh, of petroleum. So they need, uh, uh, you know, uh, alternative sources of energy to keep the island running uh, should that happen. And that's the way I would come to the nuclear question. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Dr. Solinger and Dr. Diamond, thanks for uh, for being here today. <clears throat> Quick question on a related note about AUKUS, uh, the Australia-UK uh, US uh, uh, security deal just hatched recently. How much um, was it purely uh, in terms of uh, domestic uh, security concerns for Australia uh, versus how much of uh, did Taiwan play into the equation at all? And I know the question was asked about um, about uh, allowing Taiwan to, to have a nuclear weapon, but why not other US allies in the region? Uh, Australia, for instance. I know they're publicly stating they're not interested, but uh, are there, is there work in the background? Thanks. I will repeat now more explicitly uh, that I don't think the answer uh, is to proliferate nuclear weapons more. Um, you know, my, one of my mentors and one of the people in the world I most admire is the man who sent those two aircraft carrier uh, battle groups uh, to uh, the Taiwan Strait in 1996, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. And so maybe I've spent too many years listening to him and another mentor and friend, the late Secretary of State George Shultz and others but these weapons are so awful uh, and so horrific in their destructiveness uh, that they can really never be used and use of them really should never be contemplated. I'm not saying we should unilaterally give up our deterrent capability in the United States, but I think the last thing, positively the last thing we should want as any kind of strategy is to further proliferate nuclear weapons. Moreover, um, uh, China will not use or need to use nuclear weapons uh, if it decides to behave in an aggressive fashion toward Taiwan or anybody else. They're going to have a growing array of pretty stunningly lethal uh, non-nuclear technological military options. So if you're Australia, are you going to contemplate the first use of nuclear weapons against China? And oh, by the way, no that China will have enough nuclear weapons to destroy your society once it's hit? I mean, you just you don't have to play this out long before um, 
it, it all becomes unthinkable and a waste of money and worse, destabilizing. And so uh, we get to where we're going, which is Australia uh, uh, behaving in a very prudent but, you know, uh, forward-leaning matter uh, to uh, enhance its uh, military alliance and deterrent capability. And I, I think the submarine deal is much more about an overall posture of ensuring deterrence and military balance in the Indo-Pacific region than it is, uh, you know, how can we acquire more weapons to defend Taiwan? That may be part of it. But the overall posture is that China wants, in my opinion, to be at least the hegemon in East Asia, in the whole Indo-Pacific region. I think, personally, their ambitions are more lavish than that. And, you know, if that has a belligerent quality to it, and it does, just look at the daily pace of their military uh, incursions into, China, into Taiwan's air identification zone and into its territorial uh, maritime waters, um, you know, then uh, you need a response. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yes, Carol? Thank you so much for this interesting discussion. And I want to especially thank you for your comments about nuclear non-proliferation. That's what I focused on as the UN General Assembly. I do appreciate that. And Perry was also one of my mentors. But I have a historical question, which is going back to a time when we abided by the principle of, of um, uh, um, I'm blanking, uh, <laughs> the mo most favorite, most favorite oh. nation. Uh, you know, once we, once we stopped following that principle, it, ex there was an extreme uh, increase in, in Tibet in human rights violations. And what I'm wondering is, did our change in abiding by that policy in any way affect the relationship between Taiwan and, and mainland China? Thank you. Uh, well, with that went the admission of China into the World Trade Organization. Uh, that was a turning point. And, um, you know, there's a whole field of China studies. I'll, I'll let Dory uh, position herself within it. But, you know, someone I've been close to now for several years, Orville Schell, was prominent within it, uh, who felt that if we engaged China and admitted China uh, into um, the, the circle of... Um, global commerce and free trade or reasonably fair trading rules uh, and uh, respected and uh, accepted its rise within international institutions that it would become as Deputy Secretary of State uh, at the time under George W. Bush, Robert Zellick talked about a responsible stakeholder in world affairs and that um, this would lead to engagement uh, between China and the West, China and Europe, China and the United States, more students studying, more people going back and forth, that would move China uh, in, if not a democratic, at least a you know, more pluralistic direction and more uh, responsible, to use Zelik's term. And uh, I am struck by the number of people uh, in China studies uh, in the United States and China policy circles, including the people who are running China policy now in the Biden administration, beginning with Kurt Campbell, who um, uh, have come to the conclusion that the thesis was wrong. Uh, they don't regret doing it. I don't regret doing it. I think it was a gamble worth taking. We needed to take it. Um, and you couldn't keep China out of the WTO, really. Uh, but it didn't work out. China is a far more repressive country today uh, than it was um, 20 years ago. Uh, and not just uh, in the suppression, the brutal suppression of the Uyghur minority. And before that, it was happening for a long time, the Tibetan minority and political minorities and dissidents and so on. They are creating a neo-totalitarian system 
of information control, the social credit system, and monitoring and surveillance that is positively Orwellian in its character and dimensions. And oh, by the way, uh, they're ruling out international aspects of this in terms of the export of their surveillance and so on. Anyway, so, um, you know, it's a different situation that we face now. Just a quick note, I, I never have heard about the of the connection you're drawing, but the two moves to engage China more fully in the global market, that is most favored nation, didn't have to be renewed every year on the basis of human rights. And secondly, the entry into the WTO in 1999, uh, to, in 2001, the agreement with the US was completed in 99, did pave the way for the increasing economic power of China that we see today, which is enabling all the other behavior. So I see that linkage. I want to thank, um, I don't know if this is on. Um, I want to thank both of our speakers, Dr. Solinger and Dr. Diamond. Um, oh. Anything? Uh, you hear it? Okay. I I want to thank both of our speakers, Dr. Solinger and Dr. Diamond. Unless anybody question uh, climate change and global warming, um, come to Beverly Hills today where it's <laughs> over 80 as Halloween uh, approaches. So uh, maybe we should talk about that on another occasion. Um, I really want to thank both of you. This is our first time together and you know, as a, as a, as a group in, in, in quite some time. Um, I hope we will be doing this more regularly. Um, we ask everybody demonstrate having been vaccinated before attending our events, um, which I think is, is simple common sense. So please join us going forward. Thank you both again for your time and your wisdom. Thank you.